today on Julia deployment. Um, our first speaker is going to be Reed, who's going to tell us about finite element methods. Hey. Um, first off, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about myself and how I got involved with Julia. I guess it happened about six or seven months ago. Um, I've always kind of fantasized about using a scripting language or scripting like language and just every whenever I needed performance, just calling C and then doing some measurable interface that was painless. But reality hit and never really worked out with Python. You have to write all this glue code. And I found out many times that I was just re implementing Swig over and over and over again, just kind of writing all this code that generates the wrappers. And, um, of course, with MATLAB, you have to write the MEX, the MEX interface, and that's not as uh, painless as I would like. And I discovered Julia through uh, seeing the C call, which someone pointed out to me. And I, I had played around with it. I checked the performance on it on other things. I was I was pretty pleased. So <laughs> I, um, I still program in other languages, but I've done a lot with Julia now. Actually, recently I, I proposed my, my PhD topic and all of my results we're done entirely in Julia. So this is, there's some pictures from, this one takes, there's some pictures, these are just benchmark problems. Um, I, I research finite element methods and high performance implementation of them. This involves distributed parallelism on clusters as well as GPU implementation. Uh, these are just benchmark problems for the Helmholtz equation. Um, but these were generated with Julia visualization. I will put this to a VTK format, use ParaView. Um, but everything is <coughs> done from scratch in Julia, worked really well. Um, first, I'm going to talk to you about traditional finite element workflow. Um, and I'm going to do actually something a little bit different from this, but I'm going to show you what people usually do. First, they come up with mathematical formulation. I'm not going to talk about math in this talk. They translate this somehow into a sparse linear system. Then they program the sparse matrix assembly in some language, or trans C, whatever. And then they throw the sparse matrix to an uh, external solver. Um, there are already a lot of tools for doing this. You don't need Julia to do this. Petsy, Deal2, Do, Trilinus, Libnish, <coughs> Phoenix, and there are many of these. And these, these already do a really good job. They'll, they'll do almost the entire thing for you. I mean, you, of course, you have to come up with your own math formulation, but after that, a lot of the work is done for you algorithmically. They even do distribu distributed programming, great parallelism, so there's no need to re-implement the wheel here. But this doesn't solve every finite, finite element problem. <clears throat> Sparse matrix assembly finite elements can really waste a lot of memory. It stores a lot of information that is redundant, and it's it's this can really, really, especially if, for example, if you're offloading a computation onto a GPU, which is memory constrained environment. This is just not an acceptable you know, solution. You don't want to store too much more than the mesh. After that, the mesh is already taking up a whole lot of memory. Then you have to store your extra solution states. In addition to this, the sparse linear solvers are typically black box. You give them a sparse matrix and they do something and give you an answer. They don't usually use any information about what kind of physics is actually going on. For example, if I'm solving the heat equation, I have some definition of physical energy associated with this system. I can actually use this information and, and related cons uh, conserved quantities to produce a linear solver tailored to that problem that converges rapidly, much faster than you would with a, you know, just a normal linear solver with Sparse sell you uh, preconditioning or something like can you, that. Can you say a few words as to whether the commercial codes suffer from these problems and, and, and as well as some of the public domain codes? Well, I mean, uh, I can't speak to the commercial codes very well. Um, there are a lot out there um, that don't do, don't have this problem. But the problem is with those is it's um, like with, uh, well, I. I can't offer uh, great criticism of them, but it's <coughs> if anything is accepting a sparse linear system and that's it, then it's not benefiting from the additional knowledge of the physics of the problem. Um, and that, is, that doesn't mean it's a bad solver. It just means that it's not optimal. Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to show you how I implement this in Julia, and actually I think Julia is a really 
well qualified uh, language for implementing this, this workflow. Now instead of, I still have to of course do the math. The, the next step though is instead of assembling a sparse matrix, I just create a function. It, the function evaluates the sparse matrix vector multiplication. It's the same thing, it does mathematically the same thing as if you had a matrix A and you did A times X, but I'm just not assembling A. <coughs> With finite element methods, there's a lot of information there that allows you to, uh, to reuse a lot of old computations without storing them in the rows of your matrix. Um, and then finally, um, I'll use this to uh, do a custom physics-based solver. And you kind of have to do this because when you, when you assemble a sparse matrix, it gives you global information about your problem, and then you can use that to do some kind of solver. But if all you have are matrix vector multiplications, you need to put something extra in there to get a linear solver that actually gives you an answer. And here are some examples. I mean, these, these are old methods that have been around for a while, multigrid. These, my um, proposal topic actually used a multigrid method, for example. But there are some drawbacks to this and why I think a lot of people don't do it. Mathematically, it's very challenging. Um, when you assemble a sparse matrix and throw it to a linear solver, you're done. The, you've, you've basically uh, delegated off the mathematical task of proving convergence to another research group or software developer or whoever did that, did, did that for you. Um, now that's your problem too. You've done, the, you've done the matrix vector multiplication, now you have to get a linear solver that gives you the right answer. So this requires a lot of additional mathematics and <coughs> some knowledge and programming and it's, it's, it's not easy. But the payoff is potentially big. Uh, but in order to make this effective, you can't just be spending all of your time writing C code that is seg faulting and having all sorts of low level memory problems. But you also, it's, you can't have a really high level language that is running very slowly that you can't prove that it's going to even benefit anyone on. Because if all you have are, you know, really slow codes that do this, of course no one's going to think that you've done anything worth, <coughs> worth investing time and money in. And the big thing is when a bug does happen, because they will happen, I need to be able to look at the code and say, is this a coding problem or is this a mathematical problem? Because what if my math is wrong, leading to divergence with my linear solver? I mean, I could give, be getting NANDs for a thousand reasons. So I need to be able to look at the code and see a matrix vector multiplication on there and know that that's right. And say, well, should I be calculating a derivative here or is the scaling wrong? You know, that kind of, I need to be able to make that kind of decision to debug my code. Because you're debugging two things now, math and code. Okay, I'll give you kind of a hand-wavy mathematical formulation with no math. Um, <laughs> uh, finite element methods typically work in the following way. <clears throat> you loop through every element. On each element, locally, you do some physics computation. And then you decide how are you going to communicate that physics, comp that physics information with neighboring elements. Um, I'm I implemented discontinuous Galerkin, and with discontinuous Galerkin, the way you do the communication is you loop through the edges of the triangle. You look at the element that is adjacent to your, your triangle, grab the information from there, do some surface integral, and then add that contribution to your local. And then once you've done that on every element, you're done. Uh, you can also do this with continuous color and in that case, you're looping over the vertices, and then you're communicating by whichever element touches that vertex. You, you grab that information, do something, and then add that contribution to your local contributions. Okay, the way this looks like in Julia code, it's pretty easy. This is my like first prototype. It took me just, I think, an hour to write this total. Of course, all the other stuff took, took me longer because there's no infrastructure available already. I had to write a lot of this from scratch. Um, and just loop, first top loop is through every element, inner loop is through every face. So on the top element, I think I'm doing the acoustic wave equation here, so you need to calculate a gradient and a divergence. That's uh, there. And then I loop through the faces, get the contributions, and then do the surface integrals, and then I output. <coughs> this is really slow. Um, 
I was actually disappointed how slow it was this first time. But I didn't put any attention to performance at all. The inner loops can, is generating a lot of temporary arrays to, to evaluate some of the matrix arithmetic expressions I put in there, which you don't see because they're behind functions. But that's OK. Uh, there's the app profile, which, I've actually, which has been really helpful for me, and at debug, which prevents me from having to offload everything to see. In a lot of cases, Julia will let me do an in-place operation at the, on the spot, and it's usually good enough. But I do, I'll, I do offload a lot of this to see. Okay, first off, in the, in the first case, I didn't pre-allocate anything. Now everything I'm going to do, everything in place. So there's all of my workspace arrays become pre-allocated. This is uh, from my original code. This becomes this with C calls. I didn't do any wrappers. Of course, I can make this look cleaner. But this was really easy. This is not, it is not this easy to do in any other language I know of. Um, and basically, in the C functions, I don't put them here, but they're just, they're just calling the appropriate blocks routines directly. Um, and just to make sure all the comparisons were um, consistent, I set, I used um, open blocks, that same open blocks Julia's using, and I compiled with, with no P threading, and I set the number of threads that Julia to one, so just all the comparisons are, are consistent. Okay, same thing here. Could I ask just sort of a high-level question just to make sure I get, I've got the right idea? So when you do finite elements and you assemble the matrix, you're essentially adding up a lot of sparse matrices and replace it with yes, the... With yes, the, essentially. Yeah. And are you keeping the, the sum ants separate? Is that the key idea here? Well, the key idea is it's uh, like to give an example. So you saw that mesh of triangles. I was resolving the geometry of this circle. Um, when you when you um, when you're looking at a particular triangle of that sh of that mesh, the key observation is that all of your computations really don't need to be done on that triangle. You can just look at one triangle, the reference triangle, with three fixed vertices. Just pre-compute everything on that one triangle. It's usually, it's like uh, five or six really really small matrices, uh, hundred by hundred, two hundred by two hundred, depending on. Uh, how good your simulation, how accurate you want your simulation to be. And once you've computed those, doing it on an arbitrary triangle is just a matter of coordinate transformations. So uh, on a sparse matrix, you do the coordinate transformations, but you store the coordinate transform operator for every element. So it's, say, 200 by 200 times however many elements times 10, because the, there are, say, 10 of those, or, and you get the idea. It's, it's a lot more. Whereas in my case, I'm just doing in place the transformation on the spot and then doing the computations. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay. Is there a way to dim the lights? The light? I can't read any Oh, well, yeah, does anyone know if the lights can be dim? Lights are front are already. Yeah, it's as low as it gets to the point. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> I've replaced everything with C calls. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that's that's the uh, that's not the only situation where that's relevant. There's a lot of things where you can pre-compute and just use that pre-compute like template operator throughout the throughout the uh, course of the simulation. You save a lot of memory that way. But are you ultimately going to get the same matrix, at least forgetting about roundup error, as the other, you know, the standard ways? I mean, yes, mod, mod roundup error, of course. If I if I assemble the matrix. For example, one trick, if I need the matrix, I do. Since, I, since all I have is a matrix vector multiplication, I just say, OK, give me the columns of the identity, and then feed out the right. resulting columns. And, that and then you get the dense form. Yeah, and then you get the, the dense form of the matrix. Sometimes if I want to calculate like eigenvalues or something, I'll do that, uh, of course, on a small problem. Um, yeah, yeah, it's the same matrix, essentially. Of course, mod uh, round up. OK, um, now this is the updates, I just used the feedback macro, which did good enough. Uh, okay. I thought I would do a cool test problem. Um, I kind of like the idea of asteroid mining, but um, in order to prospect for minerals, often people solve it are solving the acoustic wave equation and doing some kind of seismic analysis, usually it involves many, many solves. 
Um, so I ran on this near-Earth asteroid, which was reconstructed using uh, radar data. <coughs> Not by me, of course. I just found, found the STL definition online. Um, so doing one right-hand side evaluation, the like matrix vector multiplication for the prototype code, uh, 223 seconds, and the optimized version, 43. But the, the thing that I really gained here was the prototype version I knew was correct. And every single time I was going through and replacing with C calls, I, was a, I had a running version that had full code coverage that I could test against right there. I, and so if anything went wrong, I know it was my C code. I know it was a coding problem, not a math problem. What, what are the C calls to? Is it like some, is it the library that you have or? The C codes are there, just basically calling blocks routines. Oh, it's just blocks. Yes. I was, I just did uh, everything I just translated basically everything I had from Julia into an in-place version using using Blas. And I, I guess I could have called Blas directly. Yeah. Um, the, the reason I didn't do that actually is because I have multi-dimensional arrays, uh, like three, four dimensions. Oh, sure. And so that was also generating temporaries because I needed to get like the first four by four block or four, first 20 by 20 block. And on the inner loop it was generating this temporary and sending it off. You can, you can, you can replace that with sub and calls to the blobs directly. Really? Yeah, sub so will allow you to get a few more. Okay. Well, in, in any case, it would have taken about the same amount of time, I think. Yeah. Um, for me to code it, I mean. And, and the only blobs is the matrix vector, or? Matrix vector. There's matrix matrix, too. Uh, there's one small matrix matrix. Uh, yeah. And I think there's an XB in there, too. But, uh, Just have you tried, like, so I, I know in at least my finite element code, like, the matrix matrices that you end up multiplying are, like, fairly small to the point that actually calling out to blast might be more overhead than, like, a... Well, that's true, actually. That's true. Uh, another component of my research are high-order methods. And okay. especially in 3D, um, if you increase the order that, impro that improves your accuracy, right. you make some assumptions on the solution, you can improve your accuracy a lot. Um, but the data requirement will grow like cubically, I think, in 3D, yeah, yeah, yeah. quadratically in 2D. Yeah. And I'm, in this case, I'm using fourth order, so I think that's still like in, six. In 3D? Yeah, 3D. So okay. fourth order, it's like 60 okay. by that 60. That makes a lot more sense. Yes, yeah. Thank you. So, um, yeah, uh, but you're right, actually. I did linear elements, and the difference was almost nothing compared to yeah. the prototype code. And I, the so I, I spent some time optimizing uh, this continuous level of Angular. Yeah, the, the main idea is. Um, if you know that the solution is going to be well represented with a high order method, then you you amortize the, the runtime of of, of uh, the sophisticated uh, function uh, library calls with the fact that they're doing really big right. dense operations, um, and it's excellent for cache efficiency too. So it's around five x speed up. I think that's reasonable. It would have taken me a lot longer to write this completely in C. It would have taken me a lot longer to write this in other languages and then do the thing I did with Julia because you have to go through and write all of this interface code <coughs> or learn a tool to generate the interface code for me. Okay. So I, I was able to generate the prototype really quick, verify it was mathematically correct. It was easy for me to separate math bugs from programming bugs. And I was able to pretty quickly get to a really high performance version using devectorization in C. And my goal was to use as little uh, out, outgoing C calls as possible. With the subarray, I might be able to do that now. I might go back in and, and try that. Because um, I was wondering, how do you do this? I have these 4D arrays, which I, I did just, just for convenience. They make it easier to loop over because it's, with three dimensions you have the dimensions, you have the number of faces. It just gets a little bit hairy, um, and I didn't want the code to be just hundreds of long, long lines long of me copying and pasting the same thing over and over again. Um, okay, so for future work, I work on parallelism. I didn't do any parallelism here. This was single core only. Um, a friend of mine, and he also works on my research group sent me an email saying, oh, you use Julia, right? Um, I, wrote a, I wrote a Julia uh, interface for this uh, project I've been working on. 
And this is kind of like a unified threading model for shared memory parallelism. And it just makes, it you know, just observes that many of them are very similar, CUDA, ACA, or CUDA, OpenCL, OpenEC, OpenMP. And you write basically one kernel and it, com and it will compile off, you target your backend, the one you want, and it will just compile it off. And so it's, uh, the primary goal behind his project was to do, tar was to target GPU programming, which is also of interest in the research I do. Uh, but it turned out, uh, a lot of good GPU code turns out to be good CPU code too. You just need a way to translate it to OpenMP or pthreads or something like that. Um, and so he added those too. And uh, he has a Julia interface going. I haven't used it yet, but maybe if some of you are also interested in that and know a lot about GPU programming or something, you can contribute to his project. Um, distributed parallelism, this is parallelism on a cluster. You really need to be able to, uh, to use the native communication available uh, via uh, fast, uh, fast interconnects. So the MPI at the moment, I think, is the only real portable option here for a lot of like compute intensive and commun communicate intensive tasks. I think there's MPI.jl, which when I checked a month ago was defunct. I just saw that actually. I think I saw. Uh, was it you? Uh, yeah. Did those commits? Okay. Um, yeah. I just. I just. I just looked, uh, opened it just to check, and uh, I, yeah, I saw, saw some extra commits. I think it's actually package packageified now. Yes. Uh, that's that's great. So um, this is something actually I also have to test. So subarray is an MPI on Julia. I have not tried MPI on Julia yet. Um, And I would love to work with someone if anyone's interested in, in getting some just general finite element like tools going. Um, a lot of stuff can be worked in parallel and you don't need to know anything about finite elements. If, uh, if for example, orthogonal polynomials on a myriad of different type of mesh elements, quadratures, mesh handling, just all the stuff you need, the basic tools to make it work. And then if once those are done, you know, maybe a really high level interface it doesn't require a lot of programming um, if anyone's interested. And of course, visualization. I have some visualization code going, which is extremely slow. Um, now I like to acknowledge, thank you for Julia and <laughs> uh, to produce the tetrahedral mesh. I use a program called Mesh. It's pretty good. I, uh, if you're interested in doing any kind of mesh, I can just look at it. Paraview, I use this for visualization. I got that off the internet, and I use light XML to do BTK output for the visualization. Thank you. So there's plenty of time for questions. Yeah, so um, a lot of what I think we might be able to do in Julia with respect to all these finite element codes, which may not be so easily doable in other languages, is using really using generic programming to like write the algorithm. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, what I like to do was uh, when I wrote like a, a DG solver, I just like wrote the well, version on one variable and then like defined a Julia type that encapsulated all the other dimensions. And it just worked because it was generic. And then, since it was efficient enough, the layout, uh, the layout in memory, like it was faster than the C++ version, which wow. actually like spit it out into the, all these variables. And it was the one, like it was the same version I used on my uh, on my one variable code with like three, four, five variables, like with five lines of code. So I think we might have an opportunity to like try some of those. That's definitely, yeah, that's definitely an option. Uh, I know Deal2 has done this as well. Um, but I tend to try uh, to avoid template metaprogramming stuff, heavy C++ template usage, um, and just because the error outputs uh, really, really kill me once, once it doesn't work. Uh, when it's working, of course, it's excellent. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. Uh, the multiple dispatch definitely offers a unique opportunity here that it kind of offers like the best of both worlds. I, I don't get why it's faster than what C++ is. 
Um, well, it was it was just faster because you could like really optimize the one-dimensional version, and the program was so lazy in the C++ version when they had to like <laughs> <laughs> interaction of five variables. Right, right, right. Yeah. Like, too much pain. In, in, in Julia, the way you did it was you wrote like the plus method and the multiplication method, and then the, the flux method, which was ten lines of code, and the C++ method was like easily five hundred, six hundred lines of code, and like it, it was it, it was at least as fast. And on like one benchmark, it was faster. I am not. I, I didn't really dig into the C++ code as to right. why they were slow, but like I got the same answer. It was faster. <laughs> yeah, but if if anyone's goal is to assemble a stiffness matrix and and call um, pack, uh, which I have done with Julia, it can be done. Uh, there's all there's already a whole lot of packages out there. I don't know the value of, of reinventing that wheel. Um, there might be there might be some something added value that we can actually bring to that. That, um, that, that stuff should just kind of work, right? I mean, there's, yeah. there's not much to be done there. But what what about you know like plugging in? I mean, like the mesh uh, generators and stuff like that. Uh, mesh. I'm assuming triangle. And yeah, triangle cathedral. You mean like calling as a outside library? Yeah. Uh, I actually have some experience doing that with Gmesh because I, um, uh, I I had to do that um, internship before. Um, Gmesh, in my opinion, is not well suited to that yet because they primarily designed it to be operated through their user interface, which is a graphical tool. Um, yeah, I was just going to use Gmesh as a graphical tool because... I did it for the asteroid just because uh, it automatically can open an STL file. Yeah, in so my experience, Gmesh could graphically then and it just keeps crashing. So. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I found that happens a lot on my Mac. Yeah. And I, but on yeah, Linux, yeah, on yeah. Linux, I've had a better time with it. Okay. Uh, there's other. There's other. See, the problem is, is mesh generation is extremely hard, and it's it's really not amenable to a function call. Uh, that's what that's what I discovered. I kept trying to find a solution like that, but uh, it's really really hard actually, and they have to do a lot of pre-computation to finding like I was mentioning earlier, this the geometric predicate functions. They have to be really, really robust, and um, so it's 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 like a whole solution in one. So it's if there's a solution to that to make it a nice, clean interface where you call a function with a geometry interface in it, um, that's something someone else will have to figure out. <laughs> question. So this isn't so much of a question, but I was wondering if maybe you thought a bit about how. Uh, what Julia might have to offer as far as GPU Because it seems like and maybe some kind of more programming ability would be really helpful in my generating I think so. I definitely think so. Um, so I was actually thinking of this on um, when I was doing all those C calls, I realized I could have templated all of those functions with defined uh, things and compiled it from the commit compiled it from Julia at runtime. <laughs> Doing a JIT within a JIT, I guess, um, but getting the opportunity, giving the compiler the opportunity, basically to like unroll loops and do vectorization where otherwise it may not be able to, because of uh, uh, things that were being determined uh, at runtime. Um, things like that are actually really, really important for GPU programming um, <coughs> because it can be really sensitive to how you decompose your problem and. So for example, if you, if you feed it a nice multiple of two, you get incredible performance. If you do it a nice multiple of two plus one, forget it. <laughs> you know, that kind of that kind of problem. So it's it's really good at, to know at, when you compile your, your GPU kernels, like uh, as much information as you possibly can. So with the metaprogramming facilities, if you call a function that can dispatch off for all these different cases without you know, transparently to the user. I think that would be really valuable. People already do this in C++, by the way. That's not a new idea. But it would be nice to be able to do it from Julia. One thing we talked about, like Jeff and I threw back and forth ideas, was like in these kinds of simulation codes where you basically like set up the problem and then just like, run the code forever, like it really makes sense to basically specialize on all the constants in your yeah. problem. Like have a structure that contains all your, uh, yeah. all your constants and then like have some sort of facility to tell the compiler, like, I'm going to run this function, it's going to take a long time, so take however much time you need to compile this and like inline all the functions. And yeah. then 
Because if, what, if you have the con constants in there, like you can do all the constant propagation and yeah. as ma much amount of recompiling as it, as it possibly can. And it's like for this kind, I mean, in, in general, that's a terrible idea because the code isn't going to run for that long. Yeah. This kind of simulation finite element in particular, uh, which might run for a couple of hours, that makes yeah, a lot I agree. of sense. And I think we should look at that. Yeah. I think we're going to do I have seen a, a, a project for Python. I don't know if you're talking about making this like a fully integrated solution to Julia. I have seen a, a project like that in Python called Code, Code Py, I think. It, it didn't get a lot of popularity, but um, he, he did use it for stuff like that, Andreas. He, um, he defined, a, he had a lot of uh, constants, basically, and pre-compiled versions of his code for all these constants, and it would dispatch off through it, whichever constant it's called at the time. And it was okay that he needed to compile it at runtime because the code was, like you said, running so long. You really win in the end. Whoops. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. Anymore. <laughs> but, but it also seems that if you're going to do something like that, I mean, the better thing to do would be to allow the, you know, the, I mean, you get this fits in the whole idea of sort of package caching and all this kind of thing, right? Where you, you, you know, for some sort of long running high performance where computing kind of makes a lot of sense to use something a little bit like FFW does and you know, give the user a chance to you know, run a lot of sort of tuning tests but then save the results of the proper settings to the disk flow back figure in the machine. Mm -hmm. And maybe in Julia, I mean, I guess one option is, is that if we're using metaprogramming to actually generate the code, we'll compute it's even just write out you know, the code as code, um, you know, to make this. your advisor think? Uh, Julia? Yeah. Um, he didn't know how I was using it. <laughs> <laughs> he still doesn't know? Uh, until, no, he knows now. Until, I don't know when he found out. I mean, of course, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just kind of doing it up on the side. Uh, one day he told me to update my C++ codes, and I told him, okay, um, because one of our, some of our collaborators came up with a new great idea, um, but they had some MATLAB code, and he said, oh, it would be great if we had this in C++. But I knew he wasn't going to use the results for a while, so I, I wrote it all in Julia. And uh, um, actually, a week before my PhD proposal, he said, oh, by the way, put a slide in about Julia, just so the committee knows what you're talking about, because all of my results were in Julia. So, so you're saying you're just so amazingly productive, he was just surprised. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's, he's just very pragmatic. I, I think you don't fix what's not broken. And so.